Greetings, everyone. Hope everyone's had a great and safe week. My name is Troy Lamel Stovall, the Chief Executive Officer and Executive Director for Maryland's TEDCO. I am here today with just uh, an amazing individual personally, but also some uh, the organization is just an amazing uh, partner in the ecosystem, not just for Maryland, but the DMV. Uh, I have Sally Elaine, who is the head of J Labs of Johnson & Johnson and Innovation. You'll hear more about that in a second. I just want to say thank you, Sally, for being here today. No, thank you for that generous uh, introduction, Troy. And I'm, you know, excited to be here, excited to talk about this ecosystem and, and what we're doing here in Washington, D.C. Well, you know, I, I really want to um, start with just a little bit more about Sally, right? And and uh, I got to ask, you know, we're, we're, I think, you know, I think, you know, particularly with the work that folks like J&J &J are doing, we're coming to the end of this pandemic. People are going to, I say, start being human again. I got my second shot a couple of weeks ago, so I'm feeling human and engaged. So just a fun question for Sally. What, um, what's the first thing Sally's going to do when Sally is, feels engaged and encouraged to get out and, and be a part of? What's the first thing you're going to do? And then the other part of the question, Sally, is what's something you've been doing during this last year and a half you're going to probably keep on doing after, even after this is over? <laughs> Those are some great questions. <laughs> um, I think I'm really itching to get out and travel across this ecosystem. You know, there's parts of, of the states and the, the DMV that I just have not been able to travel to for, for work, right? I think we've all been challenged by that. Um, but more important, what I love to do is to travel. Um, so it's been really challenging not to, to be able to get on a plane and, and go overseas and mm -hmm. um, and travel. And, you know, before this position, I was on a plane for work every other week. And so it's been a big <laughs> shift, big change. Um, it's been great family time. You know, I um, have loved being uh, at home with my, my husband and my kids and not having that constant travel. But on the flip side, I miss it. Yeah, so yeah. definitely looking forward to doing that. Um, what have I been doing during the pandemic? Um, well, I think a lot keeping ourselves, you know, as healthy as we can in the outdoors. And, um, you know, I, I dived back further into um, working out and running and uh, running along the trails where I live, which I, you know, I think saved me during the pandemic. Um, <laughs> and then fun fact with some neighbors, um, I got pulled into learning how to play Mahjong, so which is Whoa, a really look, difficult game I've learned. <laughs> so we, we needed something to keep ourselves um, doing something well, different, you, busy. So that's something I'll continue. You gonna keep? I you gonna keep that one up? I hope that sounds that sounds fun. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Well, look, I think um, I'd like to really start with a, a little bit about your background. Um, I mean, you are a woman who's a scientist uh, in biology and microbiology training. Um, and, I, you know, I'd like for you to talk to, you know, there's a young lady out there who's 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 trying to be a, a woman in the science field. I'm an, I'm an engineer by training, so I understand when you're the only black, you're the only woman in, in that space. Just a little bit about your journey uh, and then uh, things you had to overcome and how you got to, to J-Labs. Yeah, so I think, you know, when we look at girls and women in science, right, we, we know there are inflection points at which they step out of STEM, mm -hmm. STEM 2D field. So I say STEM 2, thinking both manufacturing and math and then design as well. Mm -hmm. So there are studies that, that show girls and women step out at um, certain parts of their um, studies. So girls step out um, early on in, and don't get engaged enough um, in, in high school. Um, we know at the assistant professor level, that's another level where women are stepping out because they are not in, in supportive environments. Um, they're not getting the mentorship they need. Mm -hmm. um, and then professionally, right? Um, I think women are selecting out as well. So, you know, I think we, we have an obligation to our daughters um, and to the women who are behind us to create supportive systems and networks um, so that they do stay in um, and understand also why girls and women are, are stepping out at these inflection points. I think the, the one thing that kept me engaged in science 
um, after high school and college and, and kept me on that scientific path were actually all male mentors. <laughs> so I had a PI in, in college um, who kept me at Virginia Tech for my master's degree. He also employed me. So it was wow. ena enabling. I, that was my first experience in a startup was while I was also going to graduate school there. And he was completely supportive of my graduate career. Um, and then again, you know, on my, in the, my professional um, postgraduate school experience, um, the, those that have gotten behind me early in my career were all male mentors. And I think that's, you know, incredibly important. Um, and because diverse at the end of the, you know, at the end of the, the road, diverse, we know diversity around a table is incredibly important. Mm -hmm. So, so you said a couple of things and I'd like to just click on just a moment. I like those terms kind of stepping out where they, they, there's moments where they can step out. And I, and I hadn't thought of it that way, but that's true. There's, there's those inflection points where, you know, it's a tough place. Uh, it's a tough environment. You don't feel that you're getting nurtured. You don't feel you have the mentorship. Um, and is it for you, did you have to reach out to find those individuals or they, did they reach out to you? Uh, no, some of it was organic. Um, mm -hmm. And then I think there were two um, two individuals that certainly um, supported me from a manager, um, you know, a senior PI at the university to ensure I was going to be successful. Um, so that was, I think that was proactive on both of their accounts. Um, one in my professional career um, was a mentor, but he was also a big sponsor of mine as well you know, making sure I was being represented in rooms where I wasn't necessarily sitting um, for consideration of other opportunities. And I think that's also incredibly important for career growth and career progression that you have sponsors who are speaking mm -hmm. up on your behalf um, so that you can be successful and that you can get access to opportunities. Yeah, and that's tough because if, if particularly if you're the only one, was with the only black or only woman, mm -hmm. and you're having to reach out to that to those white males, you know, how do you even have that communications with them so that they can be that uh, be that champion for you? Uh, is is something I know I struggled with early on in my academic and professional career, but it's something as as you and I both are talking to someone who's out there listening. That's what you have to do. You have to kind of be willing to risk it. So kind of, it is, there's an entrepreneurship, if, if you will, nature to this of kind of exposing yourself and having a little bit of risk in that career and your academic career so that someone will notice you. Yeah. And I think it's also fair to say in reverse, if your network looks the same as you, mm -hmm. that's a big problem, mm -hmm. right? If, if, you know, if you are hiring and you don't have reach to a diverse network, um, then I, I could guess you're probably not going to be hiring um, diverse individuals, right? So exactly. um, I think it's a good, good reminder that we all need to be continually cultivating, whether it's our internal professional networks or our external networks to make sure that you know it's diverse, whether that's individually, whether that's sector diversity of, so that we can learn um, you know, what people are doing in other sectors um, and being successful, what they're doing to be su successful and what um, they're implementing. Um, and so I think, yeah, I think that's a, it's a big um, aspect in business and professional mentorship that I think is incredibly important. I know I couldn't agree more. So let's learn about J Labs. Let's learn about J Labs. Um, your head of J Labs is a part of Johnson and Johnson. But well, many many folks may not know about this. So I want you to let folks know. And I think you got something you want to talk to us about. Yeah. So J Labs is part of Johnson and Johnson in Innovation. So we uh, have embedded ourselves into ecosystems where we see innovation, th you know, thriving. Um, we really truly believe that the best science um, comes from not only the innovation that we're doing within our walls, but also externally within ecosystems. And we need to, uh, you know, be at the tip of this spear, bring transformational science and technology solutions to patients, 
in by partnering. Mm -hmm. uh, so here in Washington, D.C., so Johnson Johnson Innovation, J Labs at Washington, D.C., uh, officially opened for this this week, this month. Um, and we are here to source and support um, entrepreneurs and early stage companies, either in farm, working in pharmaceuticals, medical devices, consumer health. We are anchored here on the new Children's Nationals Research and Innovation Campus in Northwest DC. Uh, we, so we are you know, wanting to ensure there's a bright light on the need also for pediatric innovation. We mm -hmm. know that is um, underserved as far as people working in the space for the needs of our smallest patients. Um, and we're really excited to, to offer this opportunity to the ecosystem um, to support early stage companies and entrepreneurs providing an infrastructure, and, but also to um, bring companies closer to this ecosystem. So as we think about you know, international companies having a footprint in DC, um, other companies across the US expanding into a strategic location, like here in Washington, DC, um, we think this will be a, a great place for um, science and tech to thrive. Outstanding. Well, congratulations, first Thank of all. You. Um, so you want to, what are some specific programs that people can come and find out that, that they can, you know, how can they interact with JLabs and how to interact with you and your, and your, and your colleagues? Yeah, so we have a, you know, an open ecosystem we, and a, a rolling application process. So if companies are interested in JLabs as far as an incubation model, or if they're interested in potentially partnering in, with Johnson & Johnson, um, we work closely with our Innovation Center partners in, in Boston. Um, and it's through just a simple application process. So for JLabs, we have an online application process, um, non-confidential information. We take a look at um, companies and their science and technology. And then through a selection process, you know, we really want to select the companies that not only we can mentor and support, mm -hmm. um, but companies that we also think are going to be successful. Um, but then outside of that, you know, we, we do constant programming. Um, so pre-COVID, we would open <laughs> our doors to those in the ecosystem and, um, and partner like companies with like Tedco and organizations um, across the ecosystem to to put on you know science topics important panels um, bring together um, investors so we will be back at that very shortly i think as we get post covid um, but in the meantime all of that is available online and webinars available at no cost and i think that's a great way to start engaging um, we also launch quick fire challenges so these are um, opportunities yeah. for awards. So companies, uh, we put a problem statement out, uh, companies put an application in. Most often there is non-dilutive grant funding opportunities through our, our challenges. Um, and oftentimes there's also residency um, through our quick fire challenges as well. I'm excited to announce the Washington DC Health Innovation Quick Fire Challenge. Johnson & Johnson Innovation, working with the Washington, D.C. Economic Partnership and the District of Columbia Office of the Deputy Mayor for Planning and Economic Development, are proud to launch the Washington, D.C. Health Innovation Quick Fire Challenge, designed with the aim to help address the chronic health care and morbidity challenges similar to those faced in underserved communities within the District of Columbia and develop ways to achieve health equity. Innovators from across the globe are invited to submit potential science and technology solutions aimed to help address racial and socioeconomic disparities that can impact health in communities like DC. Potential solutions must include innovations that aim to transform patient outcomes in maternal mortality, cardiovascular diseases and systemic autoimmunity and kidney diseases. Outstanding. I mean, if folks, is there a website you want to point people to? Yeah, if you go to jnjinnovation.com um, and that will get you straight into information about J Labs and then also the greater uh, groups at Johnson & Johnson Innovation. 
cool. And I'm sure we'll have more of that as, as on the on, on the video. Um, let's you mentioned COVID and we talked mm -hmm. about COVID at the beginning too. So how has COVID impacted what you've what you've been able to do? You, you talked a little bit about it, but I'm really interested, um, Sally, in how it's gonna what are you going to do? I actually, what you're going to do personally coming out of COVID, but how do you see the the, the intentional the strategy of J Labs changing, if any, as we come out of COVID? What did we did we learn something from COVID that's going to change how you might deliver some of your services coming out of this? Yeah, that's a great question. Actually, something that we signed pre-COVID. So when we announced that we were moving here on the Children's National Research Innovation Campus and partnering with Children's National. We also announced a partnership that we have with BARDA under the Department of Human and Health Services. Mm -hmm. uh, and this partnership uh, called Blue Night is an initiative dedicated to the advancement of medical countermeasures, basically mm -hmm. aimed at securing our nation from CVR and threats, so chemical, biological, uh, radiological, and nuclear threats. Um, as well as pandemic influenza and emerging infectious diseases. So we signed this pre-COVID um, <laughs> and then COVID happened. Um, and this partnership as part of Blue Night, um, J Labs at Washington DC will be the hub for Blue Night. Oh, it's a hub and spoke model. So we have a dedicated footprint here for Blue Night for companies. Um, that are developing science and technology um, that are will could respond safe to our next pandemic. Um, that could provide technologies and solutions um, when we think about you know responding to our next threats. So we're you know we're thinking about um, threat agnostic technologies, commercial preparedness applications like alternative delivery methods for vaccines and therapeutics and diagnostic tools. So Blue Night is an opportunity for J-Labs at Washington, D.C. Um, and, and before J-Labs at D.C. opened, um, we essentially expanded our partnership with, uh, with BARDA. And in response to COVID, we selected seven companies from across the J-Labs global portfolio. Um, and we saw you know, how their work could fill gaps um, in you know, diagno COVID diagnostics, therapeutics, vaccine development, um, and other potential solutions. So it was essentially a surge force um, in response to the COVID-19 yeah, yeah, yeah. pandemic. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so how can we work to support these companies and accelerate you know, their development, the potential solutions uh, to patients and families? Oh, that's outstanding. That's because I, you know, look, I, I'm clearly you're, you're the scientist here, but I, I believe the next pandemic is out in some animal or insect right now. It just hadn't made its way over to humans yet, and it hasn't been named yet. Yeah, and you know, I think that's fair to say. Look, we know this is not going to be our last pandemic, and as we move forward, I think, you know, we will, we will probably see another one in our lifetimes. I'm sure mm -hmm. our children will see another one. Mm -hmm. So. How can we be better prepared? Um, how can we take the lessons learned from this pandemic um, and be more prepared? I think there's a lot happening across this ecosystem here um, in response to that. Um, these public-private partnerships like Blue Knight, I think have a, an incredible opportunity to support um, early technology and early companies working in space and get them closer to where BARDA would put a partnership in place. Um, and then commercial, you know, we, how do we commercialize these, right. these technologies and, and then also, you know, create a stockpile so that we can respond to the next pandemic. Um, I think what's very interesting and happening across the ecosystem here, both in Maryland and Virginia, is on the manufacturing side. Yeah. So, you know, we've learned um, we need to have increased manufacturing capabilities here in the United States. Um, so the work that's being done in, in Maryland, um, the work that's being done down in Virginia, I think um, if that manufacturing capability can be kept warm essentially, so, you know, it's being used constantly so that when the next, um, response is needed it it's not a turn it back on but it's it's there and can, and can support 
you know, as you were talking, and, and this next question may be not one that J Labs itself, but clearly your 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 parent company Johnson and Johnson was was a big part of kind of getting this getting a vaccine out and, and doing it in 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 what I think many of us, uh, particularly those of non scientists, would say was record time it was an amazing time frame. And so, you know, the whole as technology uh, pick, picks up pace in terms of its evolution, in terms of its next version and next version, the human ability to adopt it and, and to trust it, uh, it always lags that. And so I know if you guys have ever thought about, you know, how do you get people to trust in these technologies, particularly these medical technologies, where, you know, they've got to be put into our bodies uh, when they haven't had the same, when we're used to things taking a much longer time. And because of technologies, we're going to be, do some, we're going to be able to do some of these things in a faster place, faster way. Yeah, it's a great question. I, I mean, I think when you look at um, the United States um, and, and certain groups and populations, there's still a, a big distrust in science um, mm -hmm. and vaccine. So I think we all have a lot of work to do to, to build that trust. Um, you know, I was actually just talking to someone last night, you know, the, the Department of Defense is having a challenging time um, vaccinating, um, you know, percentage of the military, I think, is less than 50% who will take this vaccine, which is, and it, and it tends to be a younger generation who are not taking it. Mm -hmm. um, we know in Black and Latino um, populations, there's a big challenge on trust. Mm -hmm. So, you know, how do we, how do we build back that trust um, in underserved communities where, um, they haven't had access to healthcare, or there is a mistrust on healthcare, um, and I think we need to do that by, you know, bringing to light things like diversity in clinical trials, um, diversity in what we're pro providing our consumers and patients. Uh, you know, I'm pleased to, um, you know, share that we're bringing in companies that are working on that here at J-Labs at Washington, D.C. So I, I have a company, we, we have a company coming in, uh, Acclinate, um, and they are solely focused on um, an edict platform, so diversity in clinical trials. So using both AI and ML to identify diverse members who will be likely to participate in clinical trials. But what is making them unique is they also have a platform called Now Included. And this is uh, a platform to build trust in communities around healthcare um, and health solutions. So it's really integrating into cities and neighborhoods um, to build trust in communities where it's been lacking. So do you have that within J Labs, are there specific programs that are targeting um, un uh, unders underserved entrepreneurs? We're about to build some things, which I think is will be pretty exciting. You know, I think um, I'm pretty proud to represent. So if I represent the entire J Labs portfolio, um, you know, our we look across the entire um, portfolio and our the diversity of our CEOs. So 31% are female-led companies. That's great. An additional 30%. Are minority-led companies, and these are racially and ethnically diverse CEOs in the United States. So already, you know, we're living into DNI. We see how important it is, um, and you know, here in Washington D.C., um, we're excited to put a brighter light um, on um, minority-led companies um, and support them in their success. We know women. Um, and even women of color have really challenging times getting access to, to capital. Mm -hmm. um, yes. You know, black first time entrepreneurs have an even harder time getting access to capital. So why is that? Um, you know, how can we put um, some support around these really talented scientists um, and make sure that they're going to be successful and open up our networks so they can get access um, where the system hasn't provided that access before. 
Well, you know, we're a partner at Tedco. Uh, I'm personally very committed to this, but we have a number of programs that you're aware of. Uh, so, you know, we, we stand ready to work with, uh, with J Labs on this. So I can't thank you enough for being here today, Sally. Um, again, congratulations on, on getting, getting this going. Uh, any closing top comments to, to, our, to our friends in the audience out here? No, thank you so much for your time. Um, you know, we're really excited to be here. Um, we're excited to, you know, further build this ecosystem uh, to partner with organizations like TEDCO and others across Maryland, also in the district here and in and, and Virginia. You know, I, I'm excited to watch uh, the biohealth capital region get into the top five um, yes. in the next few years. Absolutely. So we all we share the same goal. So again, again, appreciate you, appreciate your time today and all you do for the ecosystem, again, for Maryland and for the DMV. So to the audience, thank you again for listening. We really do appreciate your continued support of TEDCO Talks. So this is Troy Lamel Stovall, the CEO and Executive Director for TEDCO. We'll see you next time. Thanks a lot.